In God's name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. We seem to be having a little mic trouble this morning. Is this one working? Okay. It's like the old priest that steps up to the mic and says there's something wrong with this mic, and everyone responds, and also with you. <laughs> there's, <laughs> it's, it's great to be with you this morning and to celebrate with your vestry, who truly, they deserve that round of applause so faithfully wended their way through this process over the past year plus and find ourselves where we are today. I remember meeting Nicholas Porter and the two wardens attending him uh, 12, 13 years ago, 14 years ago at Berkeley when Nicholas was on his way out and before Peggy was brought to you as your transition officer. This role was given back to me in September and it's, it's been wonderful working with your community here. And you notice they had that entire thing memorized. Those little bits of paper didn't have a word on them. You have a valley ta very talented vestry. The story is told of King Henry VIII that after he assumed his role and his kingship, his throne, many acquaintances and relatives came forward and asked to be positioned highly in his hierarchy of, of team. And as he granted requests, the king would sign the document, the parchment would be folded together, and where the parchment met, met the flap, the red wax would be dripped, and his signet ring would be sealed, and with the king's seal, that trust was sealed. The mark of the king's ring signified more than the bond of trust, it secured the position and as we know of Henry, at least as long as you know, he thought that was secure. But that aside, a friend had presented himself before Henry and asked for a powerful position and Henry agreed. This made sense, the document was prepared and signed and ready to be sealed. And he said, no need for the seal, my king, your word is enough, your word is enough. And Henry was pleased, I'm done real honor he is said to have spoken, this man trusts his king. And those words came back to me as I was reflecting on this morning's gospel, how different the posture of the twin, Thomas, from the man who stood before Henry to receive this great position. Rise from the dead? It's too much for Thomas to believe. I'll never believe it without probing the marks in his hands with my finger and without sticking my hand into his side, I will not believe it. What a lack of trust, lack of faith. And when Jesus appears before Thomas, he doesn't rebuke Thomas. Instead, he gives that all-encompassing gift of God, peace be with you, the spirit of God. Peace be with you. And then to Thomas, put your finger here. Take your hand. Put it into my side. Don't doubt, Thomas. Believe. These are comforting words for the 21st century. Jesus then follows that up with, blessed are those who have not seen, but believe. And that's you and me here this morning. We're here because someone told us, and we said yes. And we're here no matter where we are this morning in our strength of faith. There are mornings where I wake up and my faith is so strong, I have no doubt in my mind that today is a great day and God is with me. And there are plenty of days when I wake up and all I hear is the echo of my voice and my prayer. And I still have no doubt that God is with me. Comforting words for us. The wax, the royal imprint, it's not what's important. Rather, the critical piece, the component, is the ability to say yes. Believe the words of the king and the king's invitation to the church down through the generations, believing that the words are not only true, but that these words are true for me. For me. For me. The words can be trusted. The words of peace, the promise of hope, they live in and through me. 
I'm called to witness to that. You are called to witness to that. Jesus is risen. There shines forth Christ. Alleluia. And I can tell by your faces this morning there's a lot to say alleluia about. To have faith in our king and believe that he's going to do as he promises. Peace be with you. He blesses his church and then commissions all of us as the father has sent me so I send you. And we're here this morning because generations of Christians have said yes through centuries and have given us the gift and it's ours to pass on. Trust in Jesus, trust in his resurrection is an important source of inspiration, security, and joy in our lives as disciples. And I can't help but wonder just how comfortable am I to witness to what I say I believe. In a few moments, we will stand and profess our creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty. We believe in the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. Yet when was the last time we reflected on those words? Do we trust what we're saying? He suffered death, he was buried, and he rose on the third day. Really? Truly? If we trust those words, believe them, and profess them, then we're invited to confront the mistrust of a world around us that is anxious and fearful and can't imagine hope this morning. And that's what God's inviting us to do. What role does just trust play in our lives? When a couple speaks their marriage vows right here before those of us who are witnessing, by their words, they betroth themselves to each other. I will love you with my whole heart as best I can through sickness and health, through wealth and through poverty, until death. And saying those words, they offer the gift. And in hearing the words and responding with similar words, they enact this sacrament. The priest doesn't, the people who are witnessing do not, it's the words of the spouse, one to the other. Living their trust, sometimes the very act of living it is an act of the will, not necessarily an act of the heart, but it's at the core of what makes them a couple. Parents, too, must step back and give their children a chance, no matter what their age may be. Trust that they'll be okay, even risking pain and discomfort and watching a child stumble without trusting them Growth is impossible. And God may have something in store for our children that we can't even imagine. Likely does. Children are invited to trust their parents. My dad is 91. This not old Marine, you're always a Marine, and he's by golly a young Marine, does his sit-ups and his push-ups every morning. And I'm called to trust my father me along with my many sibs. When dad gives his word, we know it is true. And regardless of how young or old I may be, when I'm under my father's roof, some rules need to be taken whether or not it's the habit of my life. I'm called to trust that my parent has my best in mind and I'll do what is asked of me. I'll do what is asked of me. A priest must trust their people. Believe that my people desire what's necessary for the healthy functioning of this parish in this corner of God's world where the kingdom is being made, right here in Southport. And on the other hand, a congregation must trust their rector or their priest in charge for the time being, the local shepherd who's called to lead this community in prayer, to sanctify this community through worship, to offer counsel and comfort and act as a liaison to the larger church, inspire and direct the people that are theirs. And to add, a congregation must trust its vestry as the community that has been given the authority to watch over and safeguard the assets of the church. And in a time of transition to lead with courage and with strength, your vestry had hard work and when it came to the candidates, there were a lot of good people that they were talking to. 
and your vestry made room for God to sit at their table. It's clear. And the priest whom they chose, the Reverend Matt Lindemann, is not the same priest who left here, not the same young man who left you seven years ago. I've worked with Matt in a variety of ways as a colleague, as a brother priest these past many years. And Matt is someone that other clergy turn to as a real support. And he is someone who has led his parish strength upon strength in a parish that had some real difficult suffering some years ago. And he's there with them this morning and you can bet they're receiving this news in a different way. So we hold the people of St. Peter's and Milford in mind, even as we say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Trust is built when we make every effort ourselves to be worthy of that trust. Trust doesn't require that we're blindly faithful. Look at how tenderly, yet directly, Jesus fills the void when Thomas comes back to him. I'll help you believe, he says. And to the world, I send you forth to baptize reconcile and build the kingdom and for those for whom this relationship is on the horizon centuries from now you and me I'm with you I am with you blessed are you because you haven't seen me in resurrected form in plenty of other ways we have and you believe and trust by its very nature is always a risk because it demands from me some sense of abandonment. Do I know 150,000% sure? Trust requires something. This week we're invited to believe just because our king has spoken those words, but also his words lead themselves for us to open our eyes to the burgeoning spring around us and the mark of a God who is risen and who is with us. We've been given so much more in the scriptures, in the Eucharist that we celebrate, in the word of God broken here, and in this community of faith, the signs abound for how Jesus is alive here this morning. And like the apostles, we are sent out to witness what we've seen. Take time this week to notice the world around you and join its witness to the world. I drove down from Rocky Hill this morning, just south of Hartford, where actually the ge geographic center of the state of Connecticut. Just north of us, things get colder and whiter. We had snow covering the grass this week. And just south of us, it's always a little bit more temperate. You have more blooms on your trees down here in Southport than we do in Rocky Hill. And this past week, we got some snow. And for this Minnesota boy, bring it on. My friends here in Connecticut are saying, Hodap, just shut your mouth. <laughs> but I didn't mind it because the grass is so much greener when it has a little cover of snow on it. How do we witness to the life of God around us? Start with the obvious. Start with what you can see. This past week, I was working on a patch of our garden. We have lots of gardens. The end of the flagstone path where the sedum was standing, its stalks holding up these heavy brown what had been beautiful blossoms in the fall. And as I'm pulling these dead stalks out, and this was before the snow, I noticed right down against the ground was this thick, they have beautiful, uh, lovely leaves that are, are very porous, and the dirt around them. And then I leaned over and got down on my knees and on my elbows and looked at the grass that was growing on the ground. I was right down there with the grass which is good for someone my age to get down on the ground, make sure I can get back up. And as I looked at that grass, I pulled out three or four blades, held them up to a little bit of blue that was in the sky, and looked at that bright green. And then just crushed those blades between my fingers and put that to my nose, that fluorescent stain that's on your hands, that early spring gold. And my mind opened up. I could see my young dad my four brothers and me running through the backyard, dad pushing the mower, bare feet on the grass. It all came back in just that moment. Standing in that space, remembering that lovely memory and recognizing the power of God in a few blades of grass. Awareness of life around us 
helps us be witnesses to the gift of life. Open your eyes, look at the people you love. When was the last time you got close enough to look at the iris of the person you call your beloved or your child or your sibling? Maybe they're not with us this side of heaven. Take a picture and remember. There is the risen Christ. The risen Christ is around us in so many obvious spaces. There is the risen Christ. If we look at this newly lighted Easter candle, there is the risen Christ, a sign of Christ. Look at this church full of people. There is the risen Christ on the second Sunday of Easter. Witness Jesus' hands and feet. Recognize the open wound at his side. The body of Christ, as St. Paul wrote, to the churches of Corinth and Ephesus has many members. Here we are, and Jesus depends on us, his fellow disciples, to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to help God's reign happen around us. At the close of the Eucharist today, these doors in the sanctuary open out into the mission field of Trinity Church here in Southport, Connecticut. You circle out on Pequot Avenue and head over to Rental Drive around to Westway Road. This is the path that leads us into the world where hungry people, some who don't even know how hungry they are, are looking for peace and solace and something to believe bigger than themselves and bigger than the anxiety or the polarity that has captured them. Justice, freedom, understanding. That's the gift that we can offer. The hunger stretches into each of our neighborhoods wherever we travel this morning. From here to the heart of New York's five boroughs, south to the Florida Keys, west over the Rockies, from Olympia to San Francisco to LA, that hunger circles the globe to Iran and Iraq, to the Gaza Strip, to Israel, to the Ukraine, to sub-Saharan Africa. Hunger for justice and a peace in a world that pivots on war. There's hunger out there for Christ's disciples to make a difference. And that's what Jesus is inviting us to do today. What a gift. Don't let the week pass without grabbing a blade of grass if you can, and if you can ensure that you can get back up and crush it and smell it. That fragrance is so simple and so achievable for us. Consider that your king's rings seal and personal invitation for you this Easter shapes you into who you are. We open the Eucharist today praying, grant that all who have been reborn in the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. To show forth in our lives what we profess by our faith, take my hand. Jesus says, and be my hands to the world that so much needs a witness to hope. Be aware of the life around you. Be a witness to the presence of God's love and dare to go one step further. Witness that life to others. Ask them, have you seen him? He's risen. Alleluia. Amen.